excited to be here also at this particular moment. It's very exciting to be outside as well. So I'm going to try to give a very quick overview of what I do. And then we can take questions and talk a bit. And I would love to know also about you and what you do. Um, so I have been at the New York Times for six years now as an art director. Uh, I come from a bit of an unconventional background for that job. I uh, studied philosophy and art history in college and uh, initially was more of a writer. And now I, uh, you know, then I, I started working at art museums as a designer. And so now I've been at the New York Times for a while as an art director and a designer. And I view myself there as a curator, mostly. Um, so, you can hear, see uh, a bunch of the covers for this section that I work on, which you can see is very heavily illustrated. Uh, each week I commission around 10 illustrations uh, from illustrators all over the world. And this is the favorite part of my job, to collaborate with people, to work with illustrators, and to try to get the most diverse range of styles and voices on the page. So here you can see, uh, so each week, it's a very tight schedule. Um, I usually get all of the articles for this newspaper section, which is 12 pages. Um, I'll get all of the articles uh, starting on Tuesday, and then I have until Friday to put everything together. And so one of the main parts of this job is to create a compelling cover. And obviously that's where illustration becomes very important. Uh, because a lot of the articles are quite abstract and usually about topics about psychology or politics or current events and many of them uh, don't quite make sense to be paired with a photograph and so you need an illustrator to try to clarify the content of the article. Um, so for example, this cover in the, in the middle with the bird with a skull, this was an article about um, the passenger pigeon, the certain type of bird, and how it had become extinct. Uh, so it was this illustration that combined the skull with the bird to create this kind of surreal effect. And then the one on the right, this forest, this was an article about uh, forests in America and how to uh, protect them. This illustration was by a comics artist, John McNaught, who maybe some of you know. Uh, and the one on the left, this was an article about uh, blue states versus red states, so Democrats versus Republicans in the U.S. So as you can see, it's a really diverse range of styles that I commission. Um, I try to be very inclusive and try to commission artists that are very young, that have been working for a very long time, um, that work with painting or with more digital work or with paper. So. You know, here you can see three more examples. Um, the one on the left, the eye, that's a, a collage made by an Iranian artist in Iran. And the one in the center was a cover on the adult coloring book. And how now, all of a sudden, more and more adults are trying to explore their creativity through coloring. And so I worked with a Spanish artist named Jose Yayaya. And he created this kind of activity on the cover so that people who got the section could actually color it in. Um, and then the one on the right, this was the most recent one last week. And this was for an article on insomnia. And the, the point of the article was that insomnia can actually be cured by listening to audiobooks. And so I, I hired an artist who mostly does record covers in a very kind of classic 70s style and he created this illustration that is sort of reminiscent of Fantastic Planet. I don't know if you know this old movie. Um, so as you can see, it's a very diverse range of art. This gives you an idea of uh, the whole section. It's 12 pages, sometimes 10, sometimes 14, depending on how much content. So it's a lot of content put together in only four days. Uh, so oftentimes it feels like a race against the clock, but that's part of the excitement, I think, of the job. Um, and you can see also here, hopefully, that it's a mix of photography and illustration. And so that's also part of the decision I try to make is what can be best paired with a photograph 
and what can be best paired with an illustration. And oftentimes that's kind of, that decision is made by how abstract the article is, how much it's rooted in, in the real world, in things that have happened, or how conceptual it is. So you can see that even on the inside, the illustration is very large. And this is very fun for me to play with, to be able to show illustrators' work in this really beautiful format, printed format. Some more examples. I also, I try to work also with fine artists. So this, for example, the collage there was by an African-American artist in the United States who mostly does fine arts for galleries, but in this case you get an illustration with me. Another example. So, so you know, it's quite large, these illustrations, so they're very large and lush on the page. So I want to talk a bit about, now that I've been in this job for six years, I want to talk a bit about my philosophy of being an art director and what that means to me. And I don't know if any of you are art directors yourselves or interested in becoming an art director, but I have some thoughts on, on what it takes to be an art director and, and what makes the job interesting. Um, so for me, I view the art director through a couple of different metaphors. And those metaphors, metaphors are a collector, an explorer, a trend spotter, a matchmaker, and a translator. So basically an art director has to be all of these different things and more. But these are the five things that I want to talk about today. So the first is the art director is a collector. And to talk a little bit about this, I want to go back in time to my history as a child. Uh, my father is a shell collector. Uh, he's a scientist and a chemist, but also a sh an obsessive collector of shells. And so I grew up being a treasure hunter alongside of him, collecting all of these shells. These were collected in Mexico and the Caribbean. So, you know, in my house, all of the cabinets are filled with these beautiful arrangements of shells. And they're also all, they're categorized. Um, and so from growing up with this incredible collection, I think myself, I've become a bit of a collector but more in terms of art and illustration. And this has proven to be really helpful with the job that I do, because of course, since I work with so many illustrators, I'm always having to look for new artwork. It's also part of the reason why I'm here. I'm very happy to be here to, to meet new illustrators from, from Colombia and to try to bring uh, these illustrators into the pages of the New York Times. So here you can see all of the you know, promos and postcards that I collect. Uh, as part of this job. I also collect anthologies of comics and illustration. So I am constantly doing research and trying to catalog all of the research that I do. Um, you can see here a lot of publications that I would recommend for you to look at as illustrators and as people interested in images. Um, Nautilus, it's a, a magazine in the US on science, very heavily illustrated. Um, it's Nice That is a publication in the UK. Uh, no Brow, I'm not sure if you know that, that's in the UK also. Beautiful anthologies of illustrations. So if you want to know more about this, you can ask me after and I'll, I can send you an email <laughs> with all the information. This is the inspiration wall across from my desk where I put everything that I've collected um, and this is this is better maybe. Um, this kind of, when I'm brainstorming about an illustrator to hire for a job, I stare at this wall and try to brainstorm. And then of course, every collector needs a good way to catalog information. So for me, this has been through a site called Digo, which you can see up there, which I would actually really recommend. It allows you to save websites online and then also save uh, an image. So in this way, I can tag artists that I find, and I'll tag them by psychology, or politics, or um, Colombia. 
So I'll tag them by these different terms, and then when I'm about to hire an illustrator, I can find them more easily. So here you can see some tags, you know, animals, animation, architecture. These are ways that I keep this collection organized, and then when I, when I have an article, say, on life in New York City, then I can click on city life, and then I get all these illustrators that I've saved. So an art director also has to be an explorer. And a bit of background on that. This also I manifest in my life in general in New York. Um, New York, I don't know how it is here in Colombia, but in New York there are a lot of ruins and interesting places to explore. Castles, old, um, old mental institutions, that have been completely ruined, where you can go and speak inside and explore. So this has always been something that I've really enjoyed and that I do frequently in New York. Um, and I, I don't know if this exists here, but I would love to hear about it, if it does. This is a, a castle of state in New York, maybe like an hour away from New York City, uh, where you can go inside. It's completely ruined and abandoned, but very magical and surreal. And uh, this is a, a place called the Boat Graveyard in Staten Island in New York, where they left all of these boats to rust and rot. And if you take a boat, you can go around all of these boats and climb on them and go inside. And again, this is another very magical space in New York. I have a boat, so I row out on the boat and go through all these sites. Um, this is maybe the most beautiful boat there. You can crawl on it and go inside. This is the interior of that boat. So for me, this manifests um, in my job as well. And it manifests in coming to festivals like this one, uh, where I get to explore new places and, and meet new people. Um, for example, er earlier this year, I went to the Rafata Festival. This was in Bologna, or sorry, in uh, Macerata in Italy, in a little uh, mountain town. So um, you can really find interesting new artists and places by traveling and going to fairs, looking at publications. So this is what I've been doing here, which has been very fun and maybe is the favorite part of my job at the New York Times. Um, and for example, I saw this exhibition of Lex Folex. Uh, I don't know if you know his work. He's a French artist and he's a master printmaker. But there was this exhibition of his work at this fair um, of all of his original paintings, these very raw, beautiful paintings. So it's always interesting to find out new parts of people's work. And at this festival, I met this artist, Elisa Talentino. Um, who creates these kind of beautiful, quiet works about feminism. And so this is an example of an illustration that she created with me for an article, um, which I hired her for right after I got back from the festival, on how American home birth is a dangerous thing. So these connections and these explorations end up being very fruitful for uh, the work I do at the New York Times. So then the next thing is an uh, art director is a trend spotter. So what does that mean? That means that one is always kind of looking at the world of illustration and trying to find patterns within the work that you see. So it means that um, because I look at so much work, I'm constantly doing research online, I see these patterns that, that occur. And um, for example, one, Aiden, Aiden Koch was here uh, as part of the festival and she's been very inspired by classical artwork and classical sculpture. And then what ends up happening is I see this pattern everywhere in all of the work that I'm looking at. So there's an artist, Taylor McKinnons in New York, who did a whole series of artwork based on classical sculpture. Decadence Comics, it's uh, two guys, um, one Greek, I think one in London, who do a whole comics series based on ancient 
culture. Victor Hafnang is a Dutch illustrator, and you can see that he uses the aesthetic of the column and of ancient sculpture in his work. Tim Lehan is a New York-based illustrator, and he does these uh, drawings that feel like Stonehenge. This was an illustration for the Times uh, by an artist, Hannah Cayley, and you can see that she's using the same type of language. Jun Sen, another illustrator in New York, also inspired by the fragments of sculpture. And then a collage artist, Matthew Craven, also in New York, who's inspired by these ancient cultures as well. Um, it was fun going to the Gold Museum yesterday and seeing you know, work that was similar to this. So this artist, Matthew Craven, um, he mostly works on fine art. But one of my favorite things about this job is that I get to work with fine artists to create illustration for the New York Times. And I try to hire fine artists for um, articles that I think fit their work already. So I always want an, il an illustrator and artist to be interested inherently in the topic that I hire them for. So for example, this piece was on ISIS and how they've been destroying classical artworks. And so I asked this artist Matthew Craven to create this illustration uh, for this article. So I think the core of what I do as an uh, art director is to be a matchmaker. And what that means is that I get an article from the editors and then I have to think about how it can be visually interpreted and with that I then hire an artist and then they visualize the article and bring it to life. So it's in making that match that you create beautiful art for the section. So this is an example of that kind of matchmaking. Um, but I'll give you another example. So I do a lot of research online, obviously, and I found uh, this artist, Eric Soderberg, who does GIFs uh, animation, and you know, does work like this. So I had an article about the UN and how it has become a bureaucratic black hole, um, how, how non-functional it's become. And so I basically asked this artist to create a black hole. And I knew he could do this because I had seen his work already. And so essentially it was hiring him to do what he already does, but to add another conceptual element to his work. So he created this illustration. This is the UN logo, but then he created this black hole within it to kind of convey the concept. And unfortunately, the animation isn't working here, but I can show you after I give this presentation. He created for online an animation where this hole is going endlessly inward. So another part of the job that I have is translating everything into digital. And so I'm always trying to find interesting ways to make illustration really um, tangible and exciting online. And animation is part of this. To give you another example, um, I had an article on technology and animals in the mountains in the Sierra Nevada in California. So I had done some research on this artist, Adam Ferris, who does these beautiful, strange, surreal, digital mountainscapes. And so he seemed like the perfect match for an article on technology and mountains and animals. So he ended up doing this very immersive digital composition for online for the New York Times. Um, and what's interesting about this piece is that it was created with an algorithm. So he didn't actually you know, create this pixel by pixel, he created a program that then created these mountains randomly. And so what was fun about working with him on this is that he just kept on running the algorithm over and over until he got this, this piece that we decided we liked the best. And he could change the color and kind of changed some of the features of the algorithm, but really it was completely random. So we didn't know what we were going to get. And so it ran both online and then 
in print as well. And this was kind of an interesting example where I think it worked better online than in print because the pixels were too small to print well. And so this also is the dilemma of something that I do regularly, is trying to make an image work for both media. And I think in the past, typically um, images have been stronger in print. And now and now it's more important to make them maybe stronger for online. But ideally you want them to really work for both. So this is part of the challenge of what I think about every day. Um, and that brings me to the, the next point, which is an art director has to be a translator from one thing to the other. So there's a bunch of different translations that I do. Um, I would say the main one is verbal to visual. So I get an article that's in words, and I have to convert it in collaboration with an illustrator into visual. So that's the key translation that I do. Um, and then the next one, of course, is print to digital. So everything that occurs in print, in newsprint, then has to be converted onto a digital screen. And then more and more, unfortunately for me, it seems like social media is more important. So everything that happens on the screen or on, uh, on the website in the New York Times then has to be translated to social media, to Facebook, to Twitter, to Pinterest, to all of these other sites. And then of course mobile, is becoming more and more important, and so now it seems that everyone just reads our content on their phone. So it almost seems pointless sometimes to curate for even the desktop, because people only look on the phone. So there's all these changes that have happened, and in the past, I feel like as an art director, maybe it was more easy, because you only had to curate for print. But now you have to suddenly think about all these different media, and it becomes a little bit confusing. So this shows you um, a layout that is very print-oriented. This was an article on a Syrian refugee and his experience of feeling like he was falling into an abyss. And so to create that experience on the page, I created this big hole in the page and hired this artist, Ping Zhu, to create a hole. Um, but of course, you can't do this kind of play online because you can't play with the text in quite the same way. So you know, um, online it looks like this and it doesn't have the same kind of impact. And that's why I think that online it becomes more and more important to play with interactive design and animation as a way to kind of create the same kind of impactful experience that you can get playing with image and text online. Um, I will show you this afterwards, but this is the, um, it was for an article on the immune system and all of the microbes that live within our body. This was by a Finnish illustrator, Santu Mustonen. Um, he does these sort of beautiful, somewhat scientific, psychedelic drawings. So he did a beautiful piece for this. And unfortunately, this is animated online. So it's sort of like moving very slowly. Um, and just creates this visual interest online. Um, so this translation of things that are invisible, <laughs> such as microbes, such as you know, um, educating your immune system, we can't see what the immune system looks like. And so that's when illustration becomes so important, to be able to imagine and show maybe what it, what it might look like. Um, and this translation of the invisible to the invisible, this is why I'm interested in illustration. I think that um, philosophically this is what captures my imagination. Um, I studied psychology and philosophy in school and, you know, of course studied about Sigmund Freud. And what's interesting about him maybe that people don't know is that he initially was a bit of an illustrator because he was illustrating anatomy. Um, and he was drawing pictures of cells and eels, and I think these are drawings of you know, the brain or the body of different animals and eels. And then over time he became more and more abstract and started doing drawings of the mind and how it might work. So he basically started going from direct illustrations of the body 
to trying to picture what the mind might look like. So, in the same way, I think this is what illustrators do, trying to capture something completely invisible, like the mind, and show how it works. These are some of his drawings. You can see he's trying to figure out the organization of the mind, where the ego is, where the it is, and how it all fits together. Um, so this is a beautiful animation. <laughs> um, and it's an animation of, it, it goes with a piece on, will you ever be able to upload your brain? So it's an article on how in neuroscience now, there's this effort to um, create a whole map of the human brain. And this animation, which I'll show you later, is a head that's sort of tilting back and forth. I hope you can see this. Um, so heads, I see a lot in my, in my curating work. The head is a really good metaphor um, to capture psychology and to explain psychological states. So, and one of the big news topics in the United States recently has been sh uh, shootings. There's been so many shootings in the United States this past year, um, which has made my job very intense. Um, and so this illustration was by a, a French artist, Alexis Beauclair, and it was all about the psychology of a shooter. What makes a shooter kill people? Um, and so I thought that this illustration was really powerful. Um, the illustrator has replaced the eyes and nose and mouth with guns, and it creates this very minimal but very effective and emotional piece. An uh, example of another illustration on psychology, this was for a piece on schizophrenia. And um, so these are some of my favorite articles to commission artwork for because I feel like the artist has a lot of freedom to create art that feels personal. I think there's something about topics on psychology or philosophy that capture an artist and make them, allow them to do work that, that is more personal. This is one of my favorite pieces, actually. This one won an award in New York. Um, and this is a piece by, this one was by Dadu Shin, an artist in New York. This piece is by John Han, and it was for an article on death and dying. So, you know, a lot of the articles that I get are very intense on these uh, hard subjects. And so this one was on, um, kind of being with a woman as she died. And this, this artist used the metaphor of sinking down into water and kind of evaporating into light. So in general, I think that the artwork I'm drawn to is very abstract and conceptual, but also beautiful. So I think illustration in general should be intelligent <coughs> and hopefully beautiful. And the two together, I think, is what, what makes things successful. Um, and so, in general, I think, you know, an art director has to have all of these different identities. Being a collector, being an explorer, being a translator. You have to think in all these different types of ways. And I think as an illustrator, too, you have to embrace multiple identities. Um, in fact, I think in any job, one has to do this. Um, but in illustration, in particular, I see um, going forward that illustrators will have to adapt more and more to to having these identities. So one of them is to be a sculptor. I think sculpture uh, more and more is becoming a form of illustration. And I see different publications using sculpture as illustration. Um, this artist is um, based in New York, Rachel Levitt, and she creates these sculptures. Murals, I think, also are becoming an extension of what illustrators do on the printed page. Um, now I see more and more illustrators doing big work outside, um, in restaurants, and this is a very interesting extension of being an illustrator. I also think comics are a form of illustration, and I myself have been really interested in exploring how comics can be used to illustrate an article. Um, this artist, Marion Fayol, she's a really brilliant French comic artist. This was for a piece on why you will marry the wrong person. Um, 
but it's it's about how maybe we're attracted to people that are wrong for us, but we should always stick with it because in the end, maybe that will be better for us. So you can see this narrative happening within this illustration. This is an example of another comic. This ran on the three minutes. I have three minutes. Um, uh, this was by comic artist Olivier Schrauen, uh, who's a math, comic master. I don't know if you guys know his work, but uh, this ran on the cover of the Sunday Review. It was for an article on getting, sort of, um, making sure that you don't age in a bad way by practicing. And so, uh, this particular article, the author was talking about playing tennis and how that helped his aging process. And so this is the kind of thing where, because the article involves time, it seemed right to have a narrative to illustrate this. And then finally, um, animation becomes very important, I think, um, as an identity that an illustrator must have. So I think that more and more an illustrator needs to know how to use GIF, GIF animation. Um, I'll show this to you afterwards. Um, so yeah, so all of these identities are very important for an illustrator, and um, I'll end there, and uh, then we can have a discussion. Maybe also I'll show you animation, but we'll do that maybe after the discussion. So thank you. Siguiente pregunta, por favor. Bien. 
Eh, en manera mostró se veían diferentes formatos de ilustración. De, de qué manera en el proceso de ilustración se escogen los formatos que se va a hacer, si apresado, vertical, circular. Good question. Um, and that's part of what makes the job difficult. It's uh, everything is improvisational. So uh, it really depends on how long each article is and what article goes with what article on the page. And it's constantly changing based on the new articles that come into the section. So everything is in flux until Friday. And therefore, I'm constantly changing the size. Um, and so when I work with illustrators, I usually have them create an illustration that has a lot of extra room so that I can crop it in any type of way that I want. Um, so you have to be very adaptable. Um, but in general, I can set certain types of rules. Like you saw um, in the beginning these large illustrations on the spread. Those typically won't change, and I can tell an artist, oh, you're going to have a very large illustration on the spread. The budget is larger for those because they're so big. Um, but even, even so, sometimes those change sizes as well. So, yes, it's improvisational. <laughs> This was the one on uploading your brain. It was uploading the contents of your brain. example of the animations that have run. We didn't look at this one in print, but...